Good evening, everyone. Uh, it's so nice that you're all here. Maybe some people will continue to trickle into the room because we heard there were some traffic disruptions from up north. So, um, but yeah, nice you made it on time. Um, I'm very happy to um, welcome you to have a very special evening with our very special author, Sarah Rahman. <laughs> For those of you who don't know everything about her just yet, <laughs> which I think you should, but just in case, um, Zara was uh, born in the UK to parents who migrated from Bangladesh and she is now living in Berlin since 2011. She has done so many things. She's the research and author at the intersection of power, technology, and justice. She has held various fellowships, including at Stanford and the Harvard Kennedy School. She's more practically speaking, uh, she worked at the School of Data, building data literacy among civil society and journalists in over 200 countries. She worked for Open Oil, advocating for more publicly available data about the extractive industries, something also, well, you, you know why we invited her. Um, and more, more related to Berlin, she's also been um, involved with the Open Knowledge Foundation and the Republica Program Committee, among many other things. The book, Machine Readable Me, brings together a lot of insights from across her illustrious career. Um, and I'm very keen to he first hear from her and then also have a, a, an interactive discussion uh, with all of you. So the evening is planned as, as follows. We will have a short presentation, like 15, 20 minutes by Zara. Uh, then I will take the privilege of asking a few questions. Um, and then I will quite soon open up uh, for questions from the audience as well. So um, yeah, you can already start thinking about that while, you while we all listen to her. And at the end, you will also have the opportunity to get the book if you don't have it <coughs> uh, yet. It's uh, 10 euros. There are a few copies over there. And after that, we can all go, I mean, you don't have to. So <laughs> it, we all, irrespectively of if you have a book or not, we will <laughs> all uh, go and get a few snacks and uh, continue the discussion um, in the uh, lob launch lobby. Where, where do we, yeah. Uh, so, yeah, enough from me. Over to you, Sarah. Thank you so much. Um, I have to say, as a British person, I find introductions just so awkward. <laughs> so awkward. So thank you for, yeah, oh, doing that. That was very nice. Mm -hmm. Dying inside. Um, but yeah, thank you all so much for coming. I have to admit, I'm kind of glad that the weather today was not as glorious as it was yesterday, because I was thinking, no one's going to come if it's like this outside tomorrow. Um, so yeah, thank you all so much for coming. So yeah, I just wanted to share a bit of context to begin with. Um, Machine Readable Me and my research over the past decade or so has looked into data about who we are and how that's created and gathered primarily by governments and international agencies. So I made the intentional decision early on not to focus so much on private tech companies, so big tech, because that's like a whole different set of concerns in my opinion and could be and is the subject of a ton of other books. Um, so yeah, I guess the just to start from basics, the way that data is organized via categories, labels, can have a huge impact on our lives. Uh, category cu creation and curation has been the source of a great deal of power uh, long before digital technology came into play. Um, in, for example, in the 1920s, Belgian colonial powers uh, took it upon themselves to institutionalize racial categories in Rwanda that had not until that point actually played a significant role in Rwandan society. Um, and these categories, those identities that they assigned, played a huge role in the genocide that came later um, because it assigned cat people identities that they previously might not have agreed with and actually just drew lines in society in a way that they weren't before. And because those identities were kind of codified within local administrative systems, um, they were effectively kind of frozen within society. 
And that element of freezing identities, of kind of fixing people's identities in certain points or in places, is something that we see a lot when it comes to digital systems. It normally goes something like problematic policy um, with unfair, something kind of discriminatory, something that doesn't quite match with social norms of the day, get embedded within a digital system, and then they become frozen as they are, and ultimately much harder to change, which is why in the book I make the point that digital systems give a false legitimacy to policies, because we are in this, in this world of techno-solutionism where there are lots of social problems and people try and solve them with uh, just throw a bunch of technology, throw a digital system at it. Um, and as I say over and over again, and will continue to say, technology can never so solve social problems without looking first at the structural inequalities that made those problems happen. Um, identity fluidity is a part of core, a core part of humanity. We change who we are, how we present each other, how we present ourselves, how we talk to each other about ourselves, and how we move through life in, you know, over time. This move to digitizing our identities or providing like digitizing more data about who we are makes this fluidity much harder. And we're seeing that as, I see that as a big problem, when it, especially when it comes to when how people assign digital data to different people's identities or to different people without them even knowing. Um, there's one example that I find particularly illustrative. That's the Gangs Matrix, um, which is a police database that was set up in the UK in London in 2012. Uh, it's for what they call suspected gang members, big air quotes here. Um, and as, as Amnesty International revealed in a report, it basically ends up being a racially discriminatory system where the majority of people, where an outsized proportion of people in it are young black men who are stigmatized because of the music they listen to, because of who they follow on social media, because of the videos they post on YouTube. And Despite the fact that the being a member of this database is very, very subjective, so a policeman or a police person can assign, can say, you know, I think this person should be in the database, the, the matrix is actually shared with lots of other partner governmental agencies. Um, and there are lots of problems with this. I'll start with just a few. I could go on for a long time. Um, one is that because it's shared with other governmental agencies, the fact that you're in this database could influence uh, houses that you apply for, the schools that your child gets into. If if someone if you get if child protective services get called about your child, the frequency with which they'll take the welfare services will come and visit you. And the worst thing is many worst things. One worst thing is that you don't even get told that you're in the system or that this is the reason why you're being treated differently. And P not, not, lots of people don't even know that the matrix exists. So it makes it impossible on multiple levels to appeal to say, no, I shouldn't be in this database, or no, you shouldn't be treating me like this, and no, I'm not part of a gang, whatever that means. Um, and yeah, it kind of, it really does influence your path, the path available to you in life in a way that's deeply, deeply unfair. Um, the other kind of fundamental problem about this is that the matrix isn't even a solution to the problem it states that it is. So it was touted as a, pro as a solution to the very real problem of knife crime in London. Um, in 2016 though, research showed that gang-related knife crime was actually only 5% of overall knife crime. So even if, e big even, big if, even if the matrix was a proper, was working as it should do and would reduce gang crime, it, would, it wouldn't even make a big difference to the issue that it's saying it addresses. And I think this is really kind of indicative of how we think about digital systems and how governments and, and can use them in a way to kind of distract from the actual underlying structural or social problem. Like there's a problem of knife crime, they say, don't worry everyone, we're introducing the gangs matrix. And everyone says, wow, great work. And that's, that's just, it's just such a non-solution. Um, and because it's a database, it's kind of perceived as neutral. It's, you know, uh, yeah, it's, it's not seen as the political um, piece of, I guess, discrimination that it is. And it's a violation of privacy in many, many, many ways and of self-determination. Um, 
both both for the people who are in the database, but also for their family members. So there are there are examples of how people's children were treated differently because they are in the database, um, which problematic on so many levels. Even within databases that aren't themselves problematic, for some people, growing and changing your identity can have big ramifications on how you live your lives. For example, trans people might need to update their records on, um, or, uh, yeah, might need to update their digital profiles, their passports, their um, records on digital identification systems to more accurately represent who they are. And in some countries, this is made especially difficult. You might have to litigate who your own identity. You might have to go in front of a judge. You might have to go and prove, um, yeah, go spend certain time with doctors to prove who you say you are, which is not, which is not how being yourself should be. And in other countries, like Uruguay, for example, you can self-identify your own gender on official documents and change your own, your own legal name without needing to go in front of a judge or without needing to kind of prove anything. The Uruguayan example is definitely the exception, not the norm, but it goes to show what real self-determination could be like if we were thinking about people's own dig dignity and what people need from identification documents. It is possible. Um, we just need to think about it like that. In the digital world, or even in the world today, um, the answer to where we're from is often seen as synonymous with what passport you hold, or what citizenship you hold, or where you live. And I would argue, and I think many people would agree with me, that being from a certain place is much more than uh, just about your own identification document. It has cultural aspects, it has social aspects that you can't quantify and you can't measure. But this is really... Um, yeah, taken into, yeah, it's really complicated or made very blurry with the introduction of ancestry tests, of DNA, DNA or genome tests, where companies like 23andMe offer uh, what they say is insight into a person's place of origin uh, based on their genomes. So the way it works is you spit into a tube, post it off, and then you get your results in a few weeks, and they say you're, you know, 75% Mexican, 13%... Mongolian, something like that. It's 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 really it's really weird if you think about it. It's just so bizarre, but people take it so seriously. And there've been all these um, partnerships between 23andMe and various companies, like 23andMe partnering with Airbnb, so you can you can share your results with Airbnb and then get a special heritage travel plan where you get to go through, you get to visit places that showed up so you can relive your heritage and where your ancestors came from. Um, yeah, wild, wild. And there's also very interesting, I have to admit, very interesting kind of message boards where people share their results and say, oh my God, I didn't realize I'm gonna name my child this name because I'm actually Mexican and I didn't realize. <laughs> like, no, that's not how that works. <laughs> But there's, I mean, besides the kind of weird cultural and social implications of things like this, the, the science also isn't great. Um, so the way it works is uh, commercial genome tests look at DNA and compare it to samples held in their database. So within the database, there are reference groups, so people who are groups of people who are known to be from a certain area that are used to kind of estimate markers certain things on the genomes as being um, positively correlated with certain areas or with people from a certain geography. And reference groups tend to be self-reported, which means there are some limitations in their accuracy. Um, and different companies use different reference groups, and these reference groups grow as the data that the company holds grows as well. So that's why if you get um, results that will say, like, this may be updated, like, the accuracy may improve over time. So people are like, oh, my God, I'm not just Mexican, I'm Guatemalan as well. Wah. It's great. Um, but because our, most of these companies are best based in the U.S., it means that the databases that they hold, the reference groups that they hold, are very much biased towards the Americas. Uh, typically, people from the continents of Africa and Asia are much more underrepresented. So the results for people of African and Asian ancestry are of lower accuracy, though they won't say that. And also, ancestry might be really difficult to interpret for formerly colonized or enslaved populations, which is, of course, something that they would never mention. 
Um, it might also not surprise you then to, to know that uh, white supremacists are really into ancestry tests. And there are also some really, I would say, funny meant like message groups where there's people who are really into white supremacy and then they get an ancestry test that says they're not actually all European and they freak out and say this company is the worst thing ever. They're lying, they're lying to us, their reference groups aren't right. And you think, oh yeah, I mean, so again, aside from that, this is just an example of a digital system giving legitimacy to this assumption, this completely made up assumption that races have some kind of biological truth to them when actually they're of course just uh, socially, they're just made up. Um, and yeah, I think there was a, as a journalist who I really like who wrote this book called Superior, The Rise of Race Science. And she says, it's a, this and there's lots of other examples of if there's, if there's something to categorize, it makes people think that it should be categorized. And that's really the case for race and for ancestry. Um, and we can see this in other ways, like how, um, yeah, how digital systems serve to bolster unjust and discriminatory policies or approaches or assumptions instead of questioning them. For example, in the way that biometrics are taken from, so biometric data, fingerprints, iris scans, are taken from asylum seekers and refugees who arrive in the EU by border police, by Frontex. So biometrics in this case are part of a policy which puts a huge amount of emphasis on where did you land first, instead of what I would argue is much more important, where do you want to go? Like, why are you here and where do you want to go? It doesn't matter if you've landed in Greece or if you landed in Italy, but the fact that you can gather biometrics and that you can do that and you can send someone back and you can prove that they were, they first landed in this country that has a coast near from where you came, puts this huge emphasis on this thing that should be a non-issue. So I really, I mean, I think that in, unless we're really careful, emerging technologies will, um, yeah, will further contribute to embedding discrimination instead of helping us question it, helping to, yeah, unpack or just revamp all of these unfair policies. And as I discovered through research I carried out, carried out for UNICEF that looked into the impact of predictive machine learning on child rights, um, there's a lot in how machine learning is kind of by definition contributing to this. So machine learning by its definition takes data about someone else and uses it to predict what you will do. And that's, that's just how it works. Computers take huge amounts of data, find patterns in them, uh, whether it's, yeah, find patterns in them, and once the system recognizes those patterns, they predict what's likely to happen next, assuming that the pattern stays the same. And that last bit, assuming that the pattern stays the same, assuming that your behavior matches with people who up till then have behaved like you do, um, really calls into question your ability to determine for yourself the path that you want to take in life. Like maybe you're an outlier, maybe you're not going to do the same thing that a thousand other people did in your position. And the fact that now we have machine learning systems being built into governmental welfare systems, into all sorts of, all sorts of welfare or kind of social systems that affect whether we're able to move in certain ways, whether we're able to access certain systems, uh, means that we're that data about who we are is being used to, yeah, to curtail or to change the paths available to us in life. Um, and there's one example of this, again, from the UK. So in, so I guess, context, in the UK, in, uh, when you leave school, when you're 17 or 18, you take A-level exams as your final exam, and they determine whether or not you can go and get to the university of your choice. And you get an offer from universities that say, if you get the, these grades, then we'll give you a place. So it really matters what grades you get. Um, and in 2020, because of disruption from the pandemic, uh, students weren't able to take their summer exams, their A-levels. And the British government made yet another mistake. Um, yet another, do they ever do anything else? Um, they attempted to use an algorithm to determine A-level grades for students who had been unable to take their exams. And when the results of the algorithm were released on a student by student basis, almost 40% of the grades previously assigned by teachers. So the so teachers said, we think you're gonna get this based on your, based on what we know about you and your behavior and your motivation. 
40% of the grades were lower um, than what teachers said, which meant that lots of people were missed out on their university places. And it turns out that the algorithm took three inputs into account. One being that each student was ranked in their school for a particular subject. So it means that their, pers that their grade wasn't influenced by their own teacher who knew that student's likelihood of getting a grade or by their own abilities or by how hard they'd worked in the last three months leading up to the exam. It was a sign that if you were placed kind of a hundredth out of 200 in your year group, then, and the person in the year before you who was placed 100 got a certain grade, it was more likely that you were assigned that same grade based on what the same person in the same ranking the previous year had done. So it also, I mean, many problems once again, but it meant that not only were student self-determination denied, but structural inequalities were really strengthened because if a student came from a low, low performing school, so a school that typically had low grades, they were more likely to be assigned a lower grade, regardless of what their actual performance had been. So if, even if they were like the, the star student who just happened to be in a low socioeconomic area, who happened to be from a school who had never had a straight A student, they, were, they weren't predicted straight A's, most likely. So it really punished people who didn't happen to match the pattern of the majority. But luckily, in this case, there was such outcry from students, from parents, from teachers across the UK. And I think it really shows the power of when you have those demographics, when you have enough people paying attention to these digital systems, you can do something about it. And there are lots of examples of people standing up to litigating, saying, like, no, the system does not work for us. Um, and the government backed down as they have done, hopefully on, yeah, as they have done on many things. Um, but it did really affect yeah, students' lives who had to wait another year before they would get a place, who had to argue their cases. Um, and lots of those students are still kind of dealing with the fallout of not being able to go to where they wanted to, so then universities being oversubscribed because everyone got upgraded. It's a huge, it was a huge thing. And this is just one example of how people recognized the problems with the system and stood up, up to it. And that needed a huge amount of kind of coordinated support from teenagers saying no, this isn't right, their parents supporting them, the teachers themselves, and then people analyzing the algorithm and saying, hey, look, why did you take this into account? That makes no sense. Um, and I think if we could do more of this, kind of critically assessing the pro potential problematic assumptions within both the digital data and the creation, but the algorithms, the systems they're used within, there's a lot of potential for kind of moving from a place of solidarity to ensure that nobody is Nobody, or fewer people at least, are harmed. Um, so yeah, I'm sure we'll talk more with Aline about the solutions or ways to address this. But in the meantime, I just wanted to leave you with the, the very last paragraph of my book. Not the acknowledgments, the book. So. As feminist activist, writer, and poet Audre Lorde wrote, what we must do is commit ourselves to some future that can include each other and to work toward that future with the particular strengths of our individual identities. And in order to do this, we must allow each other our differences at the same time as we recognize our sameness. I believe that when we reduce our complex, colorful selves to data points, we lose what makes us hum human. When we acknowledge how diverse and vibrant we are as people, as participants in our ecosystems, our environment, and more, we recognize what data can and can't do, we open up hopeful and joyful futures. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you so much, Sarah. <coughs> well, that was a lot to take in. So I'm going to let you process that for a moment. And as I said, start uh, with the first couple of questions. Um, yes. Whew. Um, before we dive more into specific examples and potential solutions or ways out of this, um, I have a kind of high-level question to you, um, because you al already in the beginning you said the creation of categories isn't something new necessarily, 
So kind of from at a very high level, would you say that the problem of categorization, has it become worse, say over the last century, has digitization <coughs> made it worse or has it made it more, has it become more tangible somehow? How, how has it changed kind of at a high level? What's your view on that? Yeah, I think um, digitization has just made categorization much more fixed and much more widespread than it was before and much easier to, to share. So, for example, in the Rwandan case, in um, the Belgian colonial powers in Rwanda in the 20s, they, could, they did what they did. They assigned people identities, uh, racial identities, and they spread it throughout local administrative services. But they couldn't, for example, with a, pr uh, a press of a button, share that data with everyone who interacted with everyone in Rwanda. Um, whereas nowadays you could have, and you do have, people having dig massive digital ID databases that share that with other countries so that the assumptions that they're making, the categories that they're coming up with are just being much, there's just the scale and the speed is, is vastly different. Um, and as I talked about, I feel like digital, like digitization of a policy adds some kind of le like false legitimacy to it where you think, oh, it's, a, it's like a digital thing now, we can't question it, or that must be correct, because they, they would have put some thought into that, and often they just haven't. Yeah, this idea of data is neutral, isn't it? Yeah. Something we've just observed. <laughs> um, thank you. And you, well, you, you spoke about um, race-based inequality already, so coming back to that, I, you also have an example in your book on um, how in the UK data, uh, people use data to observe that COVID didn't have the same impact on everyone, but that the impact on ethnic minorities was actually much stronger. They suffered much more. Germany has a difficult history with collecting such data in the first place because there is, I would say, probably a fairly high awareness, relatively speaking, of the dangers of that data. Yeah. So I would be curious, what do you think is the right balance? Like, should that data be collected so we can understand where discrimination happens? Yes. Or it, yeah? Okay. Yes. Yeah, I mean, this, um, this great uh, anti-racist activist in the US called Ibrahim Ibram X. Kendi says, I think he says, uh, eliminating racial categories should be the last, not the first step in the anti-racist struggle. Because I think what we have, and it's so interesting because in the UK, you give your ethnic your ethnic identity, your ethnicity in, in loads of things. I tick British Bangladeshi all the time. And here, I never tick German Bangladeshi anywhere. And it's very weird to me. And in the US, I was, what was it? Alien, Asian alien, which was very weird as well to be an Asian alien. Um, yeah. um, but I think it's so, it's so interesting here because of course Germany writ large is very aware of the dangers of collecting ethnicity data, but there are proven ways of doing it in a way that allows you to observe discrimination that happens. And what I think, what I fear that we have here is um, lots of people able to say, oh, it doesn't exist because we don't collect the data on it because we have nothing to prove that it exists. And that's, I mean, there's like, there's efforts like the Afro-Tensus that try to address this by gathering data on people of Afro-Deutsch um, descent. But the whole kind of, yeah, it, it's, it's super, I spent so much time talking to people about, so much time talking to German people about this. And so many people said, oh, but it's super dangerous to collect it. It's like, well, yes, but context, context matters so much. And when the result is that you can't see and therefore can't address structural discrimination, that can't be the solution. Um, but then I would also say just having the data is, is not a sign or not, it doesn't actually mean that anything will change as we see in the UK. You know, there's like very clear data to show that people of Bangladeshi descent are much more like, were much more likely to die of COVID than white people, like four times more likely. And people in the NHS are like the disproportionate number of them are also of Bangladeshi descent and absolutely nothing changed. Absolutely nothing is being done differently. So I think the, yeah, it's both collecting the data in a context respecting, privacy respecting way, being willing to do something about that 
making the change and then eventually sure don't collect the data because we're living in this lovely um racially equitable utopia that sounds great yes when we get there yeah. we, we we can stop collecting the sure. data Love and it. not ask about for example well i guess the german way is to ask about first names right instead of and then pretending uh th th there's no racism we we, we just um yeah are interested in names I would like to already open up. Does somebody have a question they want to ask already before I continue with more questions? Not yet. I'll give you a few more seconds. Um, there's another example in your book that you haven't um, touched on yet that relates to biometric data. Um, and you spoke about how uh, biometric data is used to identify who gets food um, and aid packages in Afghanistan when there, when there was a severe crisis. Could you explain again what the problem of biometric data is? I know you, and in the exa and maybe also relating to the example. I mean, the aim behind that using that data was probably to achieve a fair allocation of the scarce available resources. Do you have something else in mind, how that could be done, should be done, without relying on biometric data? And maybe also similar to, to the question I just asked you, so should biometric data not be collected in the first place and never be used? Kind of, do you, what would be your your guidelines regarding that? Yeah. Um, so I guess just kind of context. There was a really great researcher called Katya Jakobsen who did some research on uh, the border of Afghanistan and Pakistan. It was one of the first times that biometric data was used. So what they did was collect biometric data from people as they were crossing from one country into the other, and um, and. As they were crossing, if you were crossing in a certain way, you were you were entitled to a package of food and I think cash as well. And if and so anyone who was um, who was crossing, then their fingerprints were checked to see are you already in the database? Like in their eyes, had you already collected your entitlement of food? And if your fingerprints were in the database, then you weren't allowed any. Um, but because the technology, this was a while ago now. The technology had b had a something like a 98% accuracy rate, but it had been tested at Heathrow Airport only. And this was being used on like a dusty border, on the border of Afghanistan and Pakistan, on many, like on thousands more people. And the staff, who are normally contractors, were told when they were trained on it, trust whatever the machine tells you, like the machine is right. So what they found was even, what. Katya found was that even if uh, people who were crossing over said, no, I haven't been here before, like I can prove this in other ways, the staff said, well, your fingerprints are in the database or we can't read them, so you're not, you're not entitled to food. And this is, uh, yeah, I mean, so in the eyes of humanitarian agencies, they say that they need biometric data in order to increase efficiency. And by that, what they mean is being able to properly, like, properly, properly understand how many people are in a refugee camp, how many people are crossing a border, how many people need food, shelter, assistance. I have many issues with this. Uh, one being that before they started collecting biometric data, they were still able to collect, to, to know how many people were crossing. Another being that it's a proven violation of people's basic human right to privacy. So I did some research um, in uh, 2019, I think, with some colleagues at the Engine Room, where we looked into the lived experience of refugees in e Ethiopia and in Bangladesh when it came to interacting with these digital ID systems that were run by UNHCR, by the United um, Nations Refugee Agency. And they found that even though in, uh, in theory, the refugee agency said, you know, everyone is consenting um, they are all saying they're fine with giving us their biometric data. There's no pressure put on them. They have alternatives. If there are issues, they know where to go. Um, one of my colleagues sat at one of these re registration points for days and found that nobody was being informed that there were alternatives. Nobody was being told that they had an alternative. 
um, if people didn't feel comfortable with it, like there were women in hijabs who had to kind of move their hijab or have someone take their, like touch their faces in ways that were deeply culturally inappropriate, um, they had no option. And then there's a problem of even considering the issue of consent when you have such a, such a huge power imbalance, because what they're basically saying is, you have someone who, in the case of Bangladesh, you have people who have fled mass violence, genocide, who are arriving with their families to talk to people who are willing to provide them with shelter and food and water, having completely lost their homes. And what you're saying is that if they have a problem with the registration process, they'll make a, they'll just file a complaint with the manager. Like, what does that even, what does that even mean? And I, it really makes it just. I just don't think consent is possible in a situation like that. So the fact that biometrics are a prerequisite, effectively a prerequisite of entering the system is really problematic. Um, and then in other cases, you've had people, you've had, there are like anecdotes of people burning off their fingerprints of, you know, just doing everything they can to not, not be able to be recognized in the system. And there are, in November 2018, uh, Rohingya refugees in Cox's Bazar in Bangladesh, so the biggest, I think the, now the biggest refugee camp in the world, went on strike to ask, to demand that UNHCR stopped collecting their biometric data because they were scared that the biometric data would be shared back with the government of Myanmar. And UNHCR and the government of Bangladesh said, we promise it won't be. We really, really promise. Um, and I did a, a like a panel event with the person from UNHCR who was responsible in lots of ways for this in Berlin at the World Humanitarian Congress a couple of years, like in 2019, I think, 2018. And he said on stage, like, well, there's no way we'll hand this data to the government of Myanmar. They just committed a genocide against the Rohingya. There's no way we'll do this. I was like, you, why should people have to trust your promise? Like, that's, that's just not enough. And he said, no, I promise you, there is no way that this will happen. Fast forward like 18 months and Human Rights Watch found out that, surprise, the data had been handed over to the government of Myanmar. And this guy emailed me and said, I'm really sorry, is there anything I can do? I just really trusted my managers who told me there is no chance that the data would be given. Like, you're sorry, like what does that even, what does that even mean to be sorry that you have potentially <coughs> put millions of people in danger at that level? Um, he resigned, thank God, um, but, and he's been kind of helpful since, but like not, not enough to make up for that. Um, so yeah, there are lots, of, I guess for me, the, the problems are that the risks are proven and the benefits are really not. So as I said, they say that they are doing it for efficiency. I did some research for Oxfam in 2018 where, because Oxfam have actually, kudos to them, they've been very thoughtful about it when all the humanitarian agencies were jumping on the biometrics trend, they commissioned us to say, to do a study to say like, what are the benefits? Like, is it worth it? And um, they, and we found that all these agency had, agencies had poured tons of money into uh, setting up these biometric systems, but no one had actually done a study to see if it was increasing efficiency. It was all anecdotal and it was all people saying like, yeah, they said it would be more efficient. That's why we're doing it. And then a few years later, my colleagues at the end room checked again, like has anyone done monitoring and evaluation on any of these systems used in so many different countries? And the answer is still no. They're all just doing it because they think that technology will help. Um, in, the meantime, in the meantime, they've got huge biometric databases of literally the world's most vulnerable people that are not kept in the most, I mean, this guy from UNHCR said on stage in front of like lots of his peers, like we didn't think about privacy when we're building it. So, you know, we're really having to retrofit privacy, which is really hard. Like, are you looking for sympathy? Like what, what is this? So yeah, that like the kind of, the way that they're doing it is not fit for purpose. Um, and now they've just got more and more and more data and the risks are very proven and none of the benefits are proven. So basically, or am I understanding you correctly um, that you would say, well, there were ways of doing this before technology yeah. came into the frame and, well, especially when it is effect 
effectively mandatory. It should, I mean, a lot of people actually use biometric data to unlock their phones, yeah. where you have alternatives available. So that makes a difference from your perspective. Like if people yeah. can choose uh, and like have a have a real choice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and if it's locally stored and if you feel comfortable with it. Um, yeah, I mean, I would say there are, so we did some thinking into like, are there situations in which biometrics would be genuinely helpful? And one of the scenarios that I could come up with was, or that we found was that if there's a vaccine that is most effective when it's given, when only one dose is given, but there's potentially misinformation spread around a community to say, you should get lots of this vaccine because it will it'll be more effective then maybe you could have a biometric database that says, okay, if you've had this um, vaccine, we'll collect your fingerprints, and then if you come back again, we'll check if you've had it. And if you show up, we'll say, this is why we're saying this, but it's just not as effective, and see it, what they say. But then, and then after the vaccination drive is over, you could just delete the data. Like, there's no reason, in my mind, for there to be a standing ever-growing biometric database. Like potentially for specific situations, you could collect collect fingerprints and then you can delete it. Um, and I really just wish people would, like those agencies would see that having so much personal data is such a liability instead of a kind of a thing that's very, that's got lots of value. Well, is it a liability for them or for the people affected? Yeah, exactly. I mean, the fact that the agencies aren't subject to any laws because they're immune because they're the un means that they don't have the risk of data protection so they have kind of self-regulation or they'll say like this is a policy that we'll try our best to abide by but there's actually nothing that happens to them when they don't um and i think if there were more if they didn't have this immunity if they had something that could say like hey if you put millions of people's lives at risk you should have to pay a fine or someone should have to lose their jobs or something, um, then maybe they'd be less keen. But yeah, it is, it is, you're right. It's a good question to think about who is it a liability for and it's a liability for people who aren't in a position to, or often aren't in a position to make a fuss about it. Thank you. I mean, that, yeah, and also your, your point on when can the collection of biometric data actually makes sense and like you come up with a very specific example because probably collecting two food packages really isn't that harmful but yeah getting the vaccine twice when really one is the most effective dose um it's a yeah that's the one case so if if that comes up we're, we're, we're going to be calling you um well Data and also identity data is also somewhat relevant for Wikipedia. Mm -hmm. And um, well, I shared with you this uh, example of Emily St. John Mandel, who is, um, or uh, well, I, I find it's an interesting case because basically we, we, we try to um, make, or not we, the community has agreed on guidelines and they want to make sure that. Um, the information provided on the Wikipedia is robust and can't just be changed arbitrarily. Um, but that also means that there are limits to the extent that people can change data about themselves. And um, <coughs> this person, Emily St. John Mandel, got divorced. And so they needed a, a, a media source to prove this. So basically an interview was arranged just for the purpose of explaining that they got divorced. And um, yeah, and that was the whole point. So there was a public reference online. So the article about the person could be changed to be clear that, um, yeah, they were no longer married. So, and that's a case where you would be like, oh, yeah, um, identity fluidity people should be able to self-declare. At the same time, we also know that certain people, also powerful people, don't want certain information about their actions, about the identity to come to light. Maybe even, I don't know, cases of like who their friends are, who they've been dealing with in the past, which can, for example, be linked to corruption. Um, so where do we draw the line 
which data should we use even if the individuals involved or affected object to this? Do you have a recipe for that? <laughs> No, no quick answer, sadly. But I thought that the example was so interesting because the, the article was literally like, th like the journalist says, I have an, uh, a question for you. Are you married? And she says, no, I am not married. And they say, oh, so you're divorced. Wikipedia editors hear that? Like, yes. And this poor woman had to, like, she, she tweeted, like, will some journalist please just interview me so that I can change update my Wikipedia page? Like, is there anyone out there who will help me go on the media record? Because, and I think it's such a good point because even if she wrote it on her own site, that wouldn't be a reliable source. If she got a friend to write it that wasn't in a rep rep reputed media source, it also wouldn't be. Like, it had to be in a certain thing. And that takes a certain amount of power to be in the position where you can say, like, hey, journalists, like, pay me attention because I want an article about how I'm no longer married. And it really makes me think, like, yeah, what about all the people who maybe are famous enough to have a Wikipedia article but not famous enough to be able to command a journalist to write an article about some identity thing about them? Um, I mean, we talked about this earlier before. Like, what about trans people who maybe transition and then does that mean they have to... I think it does in lots of cases. They have to go on some media record so that their Wikipedia page, so they don't get dead named. And I think that's so, like, such a violation of dignity to have your, the way that you're represented online in something as, like, as widespread and as used as Wikipedia, when it's something that's so personal and so about you that you can't change something about that, like, about who you are. Like, it makes me think of whether there's maybe protected characters char characteristics that there, that could be edited or that there would be different rules about reliable sources about or s in some way like there has to be something other than making everyone go to and talk to a journalist about their own gender expression like that's 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 not it that's not the goal of this whole thing no i mean it's it's yeah. uh, that's not the goal at the same time yeah where so you could exempt certain categories because at the y you also want transparency. I mean, there are politicians who are like, no, I never said that, and I never owned this company. I never did this or that. Mm, and but that's why I'm, I think about it in the context of like certain characteristics or certain maybe identity. I don't know. I'm sure you've all spent so much more time thinking about this. I'm literally sitting in the Wikimedia Deutsch. Like, who am I to explain this? <laughs> I don't know. But like, yeah, maybe there are certain data points about who someone is, about their identity, about things that they should control. So not things like, I'm friends with this person, there was a photo of me with this person, I own this company. Not things that are about people of power and power relationships, but things that are literally like, this is who I am, that should be under different rules. I don't know. I would actually be really keen to hear if, like, what the discussions are here about that kind of thing. I'm not going to... <laughs> well, <it's really laughs> Everyone's looking the opposite direction, so it's cool. We don't have to discuss it now. It's really mostly <laughs> up to the community, so um, yeah. But, but isn't yeah? I don't know. Maybe this is like going too much down a rabbit hole. But isn't there some responsibility? Because like, isn't there some responsibility of you all as Wikimedia Deutschland to guide the community or to like push them towards a certain thing? Because especially if there's like, for example, if we think about lots of the issues in the book, there's so many examples of people who aren't affected by any, like all the people who designed or are involved with the gangs matrix, they all thought like, sure, this is great. This is a fair way of dealing with this problem. And that's because they're not affected by, most of them aren't young black men who like listening to a certain type of music. And that's why they thought this technical system was fine. And we know when we look at the demographics of the Wikimedia, Wikipedia community, that they're likely also not affected by the issues that we're talking about of wanting to self-determine in ways that aren't that that change throughout your lives and that aren't you know necessarily fixed fit in these boxes. So isn't there like a responsibility? Yeah, no, we're really going down a rabbit hole. Um, but yeah, isn't there a yeah, responsibility I mean, we, we to we help guide identity data in that way? I mean, we can. There are a lot of types of responsibility and kind of the. Um, I mean, I would hope that some 
also some of the Wikipedia contributors maybe get divorced or so. <laughs> so, so, so I hope they get I mean, divorced. <laughs> um, so <laughs> probably not the ones. <laughs> well, so, so they would be able to empathize with people who have certain life changes. Mm. Um, that's all I wanted to say. So, um, no, I know what you mean. Yeah. So, um, yeah, but again, like we, the, the community works as it does because we generally don't interfere and there are certain processes to make sure I, I there's know. shared responsibility, but we can, we can pick that up also afterwards. I mean, yeah, so it, it doesn't mean that each person is always on board with each and every policy and it keeps evolving. So there's certainly fluidity in that. Yeah, um, sorry, I didn't mean to put you on the spot. Sorry. That was okay. a general, we're in the offices question. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think there's a lot of a lot of stuff, especially as yeah, as Wikipedia is such a source of data about people created by other people. I think that does put a lot of responsibility on editors and on I mean, I was in this ridiculous edit war in like 2015 with about this oh, it was so it was just so stressful. It was this uh, this woman called Hedy Lamar who was uh an actress and also contributed to the technology that is the basis for Wi-Fi, for wireless internet. And her Wikipedia page just said, and she was also, she, she was an actress and she did various things and got married a lot and blah, blah, blah. And, but she was instrumental to creating the technology for Wi-Fi as we know it today. And that fact was only mentioned like way, way down in her profile and I, edited it so that it was like Hedy Lamarr, born, blah, 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 also contributed to da, 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 da. And these guys just kept saying, no, this isn't relevant. The fact is that she appeared nude on screen and that was way more relevant than the fact she contributed to Wi-Fi. And it was so frustrating to, to just be like, no, it isn't. Like, it's not more relevant. Why is, why is that more relevant? And I, yeah, I just, yeah, it's just, and that was, it's such a, I mean, obviously, like, she, she's dead, so she can't edit, <laughs> or actually care, um, but it's such a, it has such a legacy on how, yeah, on her legacy, on how she's remembered, because if you just look at the top paragraph, and you think, oh, yeah, that's who this person was, she was married to the person who did this and this and this, um, and it has such control over how she is, is remembered now. Yeah, I mean, I know you, you are aware of, of uh, the efforts we're making oh, yeah, to of course. Um, have more knowledge, equality, and make sure different mm -hmm. perspectives are um, reflected and not just, well, th of, of those who, who have certain power. Mm -hmm. But yeah, th there are certainly issues, and it's important to also uh, raise awareness, which hopefully sometimes contribute to um, better outcomes. I, well, one more question, then I'll open up f and, and, and see um, if you have more questions. So, what I would be curious to hear from you, I mean, this, uh, what we just talked about kind of touches on that already. So because you, I, I think you've spent a lot of time being close to people who had the experience of being marginalized, who could then empathize also other people who were maybe marginalized because of other reasons. Um, are there examples you where you think that, well, they, it's, how do I, how, how do I phrase this? That also people who don't have direct experience of being marginalized can find it easier to put themselves in the shoes of other people, because I know, I mean, especially Germans, to be honest, like the, with the passport, this kind of, those examples of like being able to travel anywhere, not needing a visa, like, I, I don't know, my, my impression is that a lot of people struggle to understand what, what the problem is also with biometric data. I mean, probably here in the room, we, people are aware, otherwise they wouldn't be here, but how do you, um, oh, what is, what is your, um, do you have a favorite example for other people? Yeah, I mean, I feel like at the heart of what you're asking is how do we get people to have empathy? Because it doesn't really matter whether it's about 
biometric data or passports. It's like, how do you get people to empathize with a position that they're not in and to understand that being in that position sucks or being in that position makes them feel like a certain way. And having empathy and acting from a place of solidarity, I think is actually kind of the struggle of all social justice movements right now, especially, and especially here in Germany, to imagine that you're not, like, we're so lucky we're in this, this society, we have all these benefits, that kind of thing, and that there are so many other people who don't. Um, yeah, I mean, I, <laughs> yeah, I think, like, like, lots of things that I wrote in the book, like, it actually has absolutely nothing to do with data or technology and instead just kind of more about finding your own humanity, like, in a way that, and I don't know if that, I mean, I don't know, I don't know if it is particularly German or just a general thing of privilege to not want to extend your humanity to people who aren't like you or who don't look like you. I will say in the in the interviews and in the examples where I've spoken to German media, they all do say that every single one of them have said, have you got some more examples about Germany? Because the readers will understand and be able to like empathize more with those. It's like, really? Like, that's that's not very kind. <laughs> like, I don't know. I mean, so maybe it is a, a particularly German thing. I don't know. Um, but yeah, I I don't I don't know. Aside from everyone looking deep within themselves and finding humanity. <laughs> yeah. Well, and and I guess also examples that wouldn't necessarily <coughs> happen to <laughs> certain people. So the examples, yeah. the many examples you you use, I hope make make the experience more tangible to everyone. Yeah, I mean, I had one, I'm totally the kind of person that reads the reviews that people leave online about my book. Um, and I had one review <laughs> that was like a two star review where someone called, I can't remember, it was a man's name, left a review saying like, none of these would ever happen to me. Like, why is the subtitle how tech shapes our identities? This is not how it shapes my identity. I'm not a refugee. And he was like, all she talks about is refugees and asylum seekers and black people and this and this. And like, I'm not any of them. It's like, yeah, no, I agree. You, you, you aren't clearly, wow, that is a, that is a vibe. Like, to, to, to put that online and to... To go you with think that, you don't have anything in common with yeah, these people, like you right? Exactly, like, exactly. Yeah. And the point was really like, I'm not like that. Like, ugh, how dare she use the word "our"? Like, that is a, a show of a lack of humanity that is is concerning. Um, yeah, but yeah. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> Do you have questions? I mean, I have more, but uh, yes. Um, yeah, thank you for this conversation um, for writing the book. I really appreciate a lot about it, um, but especially um, seeing that you have these guiding principles and you touched upon them, but I think it would be very interesting to hear more about what are the principles that you stick to while doing the research because I feel like your vision is very clear. It's very clear why you do the work you do and who you are advocating for. Mm -hmm. um, and I think sometimes people just get lost in certain discourses because they don't have guiding principles. Mm. And you talked about self-determination, but I think maybe there's some more. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I guess as I said, or as I write in the book, I've always looked at the, the people for whom digital systems don't work, because I think you can really see a lot about values and who is prioritized in that kind of system. Um, and as Reham said, kind of, uh, yeah, self-determination. And just, I mean, it sounds, it sounds cheesy, and I said this in an article recently as well, um, like justice, like that we should all, not that everyone is treated equally, but that we are all equitably treated based on the very real existing structural inequalities and inequities that are there in life um, in our societies today. And I think that's, yeah, that's definitely a, a motivation for me and a way in which I analyze the, yeah, the, the systems, like how does power move within these systems? Who has power? Who can decide what happens? Who has power over? Who has power with? Who has power under? Um, and I think it's kind of a, yeah, just a feminist approach of uh, analyzing how, starting from a point of thinking about how power moves within these systems. And I, 
yeah, I I wish more people who designed systems like this, like I feel like it would have been such an easy conversation at the beginning of things like the gangs matrix or the biometric data for Rohingya refugees to think like, how could this go wrong based on what we know about society or about the London Metropolitan Police with its huge institutional racism problem? Like, how do we think that could go wrong? Um, and it could be, it could have been so easy to just just have that discussion and think, let's let's do it in a different way. Like, if we have to throw some silly technical solution at this problem, then let's just do it in a way that doesn't exacerbate existing harms. Um, and they they didn't. Um, but yeah, I think starting from a position of analyzing power is really yeah. nice. More questions? So, um, uh, there were many points, there's a lot of dots to connect. Um, but I, there was one, so I, I'll give you the, the overarching question and then I'll like, oh. Talk into the microphone. No? Yeah. Oh, it is working. <laughs> okay, so um, my question is, do you think that we are speaking the same language as these people who have ridiculous amount of powers? Because when we're talking about empathy, we're talking about self-determination, we're talking about taking into consideration the humanity of all these people affected, specifically marginalized, <laughs> And when you were talking about the example of um, humanitarian agencies collecting data without conducting studies, it's a sort of cavalier approach. It's like, do, and then maybe reflect afterwards, and then maybe we break stuff, and then we figure it out. It's the same as tech companies, private tech, where they just collect a bunch of data, and then eventually they realize, ooh, we can do some stuff with this, ooh, we can make profit. And so a lot of people get hurt, and in here there's this logic of conquest where you just go, you just do stuff. And that's where fingerprinting surveillance started, started in India under British colonialism. So I guess the question is when we see why these things happen and what is lacking is empathy from your perspective as someone who's been researching, I just wonder, do you think we are speaking the same language as these people who make these decisions? Is it actually possible to bridge the conversation? I think it's a really good question. And I will say, this is the first time that I've kind of come to the logical conclusion that empathy is the thing. So that's an interesting self thing to think about. Um, no, I don't think we are speaking the same language. I think, I think there's a kind of this idealistic idea that all we need to do is help them see our side or help everyone think in the same way and then people with power will be like oh wow my bad here you go take take the power let's all share it out equally um and i think i definitely i used to i definitely went through that phase of being like we just need i just need to explain myself better like i just need to to build relationships and and do that and um no i don't think anyone with power has ever not anyone there are examples, few. Um, I don't think a majority that holds power, or a minority that holds power is ever going to willingly give up that power. And I think that's why we say we fight for social justice, not we, I don't know, ask nicely for it. Like, we don't, you know, you know, that's not how power gets shared. That's not how any kind of revolutions have happened. That's not how ma any major social shifts have happened. Um, and that's sad in a way. Of course, but I also think at some point power corrupts and power like stops you from thinking straight, maybe. Um, and I don't know what that looks like, but I think there are ways of taking back that power that are moving from a place of solidarity and empathy and aren't just like, you did bad things to us, so we're going to do that to you, because I think that's what got us in this whole mess in the first place. Um, but instead, like, no, we're moving to a better place for all of us, and that's what we need to be doing. Um, and I think it's exciting. I mean, for me, part of writing this book was I spent so long critiquing other people's digital systems and like finding problems with tech and thinking like, that's not gonna work. You're harming this people, this, these people, that's the worst, how could you? And being part of all these working groups and going to talk to people and, and it just got exhausting after 10 years of, of sitting with 
you know, different people, but the same institutions and saying like, no, this is the same thing that we talked about like three years ago. It's still not right. And it's still not going to treat people the way that you think they should. It's not the values at the heart of it aren't right. And for me, writing this is like, OK, enough, enough explaining myself, enough critiquing, enough saying like this is why it doesn't work. And what I'm more interested in next in is like, so what now? Like now that we know that the harms of tech are very well documented, what does that mean for what we build? And like, how do we stop? How do I stop focusing my energy on like, stop doing that? And more on like, yes, let's let's do that. And it is a lot harder. It's a lot harder to, to build than it is to just critique and point out problems. And I have to admit, I kind of love pointing out problems and things. Like any good feminist, we love problematizing things. It's, it's great. And just be like, no, that's not great. Um, and yeah, trying to shift myself, I'm trying to shift myself into more of a, how do we build and what do we build and how do we move and how do we do it in a way that works for everyone and not just for a certain few. Good evening. <coughs> um, thank you. Uh, thank you so much for, for what you talked about. Uh, very inspiring, uh, especially because if, until a few months ago, I was the owner of the Oxfam policy that you mentioned. Oh. Cool, hi. <coughs> yeah, <laughs> so really interesting. Um, and actually, I could follow up a little bit uh, on, on things Please. because. Okay. Um, and then I have a question and a thought uh, on identity management. Um, yeah, to follow up a little bit. Uh, so it's interesting what you're saying in 2018 because in 2019, uh, the World Food Program was bullying basically INGOs into collecting the biometrics of Rohingya mm. to be able to get EU money, which is crazy. <coughs> So we told them, oh, we don't want to say no because obviously we have conflicts of interest, but that sounds awful. So how about we apply human, uh, uh, human rights law? And so that requires a data protection impact assessment. And so we went there. They were very excited. We were the first one to do this, which we thought was horrifying. Um, and, and then when the report became very, very red, all of a sudden the project uh, got shut out. But um, mm. so it was interesting because they were collecting the biometrics of children. Uh, as you say, and I'm happy to go on, on this, so the notion of consent, um, so actually we're agreeing now with data protection officers in the humanitarian sector that it's actually ag aggressively legal to continue to talk about consent in that case, because yeah, the very notion of consent says that you actually know and can say no, mm -hmm. and that is never the case there, never. Um, but so yeah, biometrics of children, I think it was from five, which is crazy and completely illegal in the EU, typically. Uh, prevention. So they were saying it was for the prevention of fraud, which they never gave, gave us the data. I know you know this. And so, but you know, it's interesting because I was just arriving in the humanitarian sector, and maybe I'm wrong. But typically, when I'm arriving and I'm told this, I'm like, wait, wait, what are we talking about? You're collecting the biometrics of children because people are stealing soap? Mm. Get real. This yeah. is mad. Um, I mean, I had a conversation with someone once where they said also fraud, and they were like, yeah, I mean, each person, like, we only have enough so that each person should get 50% of the calories that they are allowed per day, and that they need, like, the daily allowance or recommended daily allowance. Mm -hmm. So what they considered was fraud was someone trying to obtain 100% of the calories that they need for their recommended daily allowance, also for children. It's like, how can you... Like, how can you sleep at night saying that that is fraud? How dare you? It's bizarre. It's bizarre. No deletion of data, which is aggressively illegal. Um, and as you pointed out, so I had these conversations with the UN several times about them saying, oh, but we don't have to apply local laws. And you think, yeah, but we're talking about human rights laws, so I wouldn't be too proud about that if I were <laughs> you, but they don't care. Yeah. Um, and so, on, on, so moving on the question slash comment, so it's, it's very interesting, these questions of identity management, because, yeah, I had these questions on and on, especially because, as you pointed out, at Oxfam, we refuse to, to indulge into this bullshit. Um, and so I was wondering whether you had looked into, because when I talk with fascinating um, cybersecurity and crypto nerds, um, they are starting to come up with things. Mm -hmm. And so they're talking about zero trust knowledge systems of managing uh, identity. So, you know, I agree with you, social in, uh, soci tech solutionism is, is incredibly problematic. But I think crypto is a little bit different because crypto is also about what helps to protect people from censorship, from surveillance. So, and it doesn't have to be very, 
you know, it doesn't have to be very heavy in terms of the resources consumption. So anyways, <coughs> I think what could be potentially a system, but that's typically why I'm, I'm interested to throw it here in case someone has thoughts on the how, it, why it wouldn't work. But so <coughs> typically, as I understand, um, there could be now systems where, you know, you, you generate uh, something that is uh, a token of your identity and you also share with uh, people that you have chosen uh, hashes of that token so that if you lose it or something, they can recreate it. And I quite like this idea of actually a community-based identity um, so that if, yeah, if you have problems, you have actually already chosen yourself people that you want to be able to vouch for, yes, this is... Uh, this person's identity, or to create at least an ability to, to for you to change that that identity if if there's a need. Obviously, the challenge of Wikimedia is really interesting because I could not uh, think how this could work with uh, Wikimedia, for example, because you guys are documenting the identity of someone else, which is mm -hmm. very different. But this is it. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you so much. Excited to talk more. Um, yeah, I uh, I don't know enough about that kind of approach to be able to really comment on it, I think. Um, I will say there have been some tech solutions that I find more interesting than others in the humanitarian space. So for example, one company who produces a little key fob where they put your bio, because the question is like, do does this thumb match the thumb of someone who, who previously said they were me? Um, so what they do is put your thumbprint on and store it on a little key fob that you can carry with you. So that when you go, all you need to do is say, all they need to check is, is this thumbprint the same one that's on this key fob? So it means they don't actually have to store any data and you carry it with you the whole time. And it makes it much more about you deciding like, yes, I, I hold my data and I can do this. Obviously problems of like, what if you lose the key fob? Then, you know, whatever. Um, and I guess that would be similar for, for that kind of issue. Um, but yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, I have an inherent skepticism towards like the blockchain People just being like, blockchain, crypto. Um, but that's just my own bias based on lots of... Yeah, I mean, that's why I said blockchain and crypto. But yeah, I mean, I had like towards uh, emerging technologies that have often... I think I've, I've just spoken to or seen too many examples of well-meaning tech students or people in a lab in a US in a US based university have lots of money and come up with some solution to a humanitarian issue and go and are like, oh look, we can solve it like this. Like like once I got commissioned to write an article or write uh, do some research into the use of robots in refugee camp classrooms in the Middle East. <laughs> and they wanted us to write a feasibility study on would they be helpful? <laughs> and I was like, no, no, <laughs> no, they would not be, but let me do this research for you. And it turns out that it was funded by, a, this isn't how really made up, by a Saudi prince who gave money to a lab, who also gave money to a robotics lab, who was already in the process of building the robots that were, that the study was about. And obviously we talked to teachers and they were like, no, the problem isn't that we don't have robots. The problem is that we don't have enough money and we don't have enough space and we don't have enough teachers. And it's like, well, there are some very proven interventions that would be very good uses of these hundreds of millions of dollars that you want to spend. And the people we were working for were like, yes, but how do we get robots in there? And they really, like, we came to this block where they were like, no, we want you to say that robots are useful because we're already sending them and a prerequisite of working with this agency is that we've done a f an independent feasibility study like well good luck finding someone who tells you that robots are the thing that are needed in education in classrooms in refugee camps in the middle east it was so specific and yet just so wild that this was the thing that was going and it was hundreds of millions it could have made like such a difference to this scenario um, so yeah, I have a existing biases towards not loving new tech things, but that's not to say there aren't like again my own biases. I don't know. Um, I'd love to hear more. Yeah, we can go m more deeply into this uh, shortly. We're kind of already over time, but I I know I promise. Like I also wanted to talk more about 
where do we go from here now? I, mean, I think we've touched on this, and I think you've opened up a lot of perspectives already, but I would like to ask just a short final question of your one, two, three, <laughs> whatever you, uh, w which number you feel is appropriate, what would be the policy change or the policy changes you would really like to see first? What's the next step or steps from here? Hmm. I mean, I'm really torn between like solidarity, empathy, humanity done um, or like data minimization just like a really basic one just just stop collecting data when you don't know what you're going to use it for and once you've used it for the purpose delete it I think in the case of like lots of the examples here that would be just like a basic one or just respecting I mean there's such a there's such a double standards at play here of you know, rich Western countries trying out things. In, you know, colonialism is a thing. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, I'd guess data minimization if I had to be very specific on a, on a policy. Um, and I think for, for people, and this is why I wrote a book that's very small and hopefully readable <coughs> and, and accessible and interesting to people outside of this space. Um, like an, uh, an acknowledgement or a kind of critical assessment of technology instead of thinking like, ooh, technology, it's the thing that's gonna save us. Um, so yeah, just people more being a bit more uh, critical about what role technology is playing in their lives. And then feeling, hopefully, that they can do something about it. Like there are so many examples of people saying, hey, no, we all, like moving from a place of solidarity and saying like, no, we all don't think this is right, it shouldn't be like that. And it works if enough people say it. Um, so realizing the power of organizing and, and agency and self-determination in turning. And just acknowledging that none of this is inevitable. Like, none of this is because it's the way it has to be. It's because it was imagined by a bunch of people in Silicon Valley. And we can imagine something different and we can make that happen too. Well, thank you so much. Yeah, technology shouldn't be something that's rolling over us and... Um, I yeah I hope the book is one step that helps us to speak a more similar language perhaps and helps to build up that empathy that we need to move in the direction that I guess all of us would consider very much desirable. So yeah, thank you so much for sharing your insights with us and I look forward to continuing that over snacks. Thank you.